Uh, so good afternoon everyone uh, welcome to the first uh, colloquium physics department colloquium talk of this uh, semester and we'll be having a series of talk uh, in this semester we'll let you know in due time and uh, before uh, starting uh, before giving the introduction about the speaker i would like uh, our head of department professor uh, uh, professor ghosh Uh, to say few words about uh, the, the motivation and objective of uh, colloquium uh, thank you pankaj um the motivation is very simple is uh, to get uh, people together and uh, get ourselves uh, accounted with uh, the exciting things around and uh, basically the idea of physics colloquium is uh, not just uh, to confine ourselves to physics talks but uh, more of a interdisciplinary talks and anything about science and society um we had started it uh, since last year and there were few talks but after that this covid 19 struck and everything uh, all plans actually went uh, waywards but we are back again after a hiatus and we hope that we'll be able to continue this uh, for the next few months with uh, support from your side the first talk uh, of this season we had purposefully chosen uh, professor uh, sachin because he has been working on this vaccines uh, related to the covid 19 and what better can be a topic than this at this uh, moment of you know pandemic stricken world so with this i would like uh, pankaj to take over and i welcome uh, dr sachin kumar and all the participants in this webcam thank you so thank you professor ghosh uh, for such a nice uh, introduction and uh, now on the, i formally um, the start this uh, colloquium and uh, before that uh, the, it's a pleasure to have uh, today's speaker like professor ghosh also mentioned uh, professor sachin kumar from biological science and biological engineering uh, who is also contributing quite actively uh, in the covid vaccine uh, research and uh, he has been in news uh, since a couple of months and uh, so already uh, um, the many of you know him quite well but just for sake of um the colloquium introduction i just uh, would like to mention few things about him uh, that he completed his uh, phd from uh, the university of maryland in 2010 and then he joined uh, the uh, uh, iit guwahati as an assistant professor in bsb department in 2012 before doing couple of post docs one is maryland and another one is pennsylvania his uh, the topic of research uh, mainly uh, related with uh, uh, this uh, paramyxi viruses that include viruses that are isolated from many species of terrestrial avian and aquatic animals and today he is going to tell more about uh, the, his work on paramyxi virus and uh, his uh, uh, his uh, title of the topic uh, uh, today's talk is understanding the biology of uh, avian paramyxi virus for the development of recombinant vaccine so with that uh, i again welcome uh, professor sachin kumar and uh, hand over the floor to him professor sachin kumar thank you dr pankaj am i audible yeah 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 so, so uh, 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 uh so i have one request to everyone uh, please uh, switch off your microphone unless and until you use it so once you use it then you can uh, put it on otherwise switch it off okay professor yeah uh, uh, thank you dr pankaj and uh, for giving me an opportunity to uh, talk something about uh, the biology of avian paramyxo virus and something which we are doing for uh covid 19 uh, in recent uh, time so um i have just divided my talk uh, purposefully on understanding the biology of avian paramyxo virus so half of the talk will be little bit regarding the virus which i am working on and uh, next half i just uh, divided in the in the sense that i would give a flavor uh, to the audience that how we can uh, we have generated some sort of vaccine using the model which we are studying and also how we are contributing towards the covid 19 so um i, I i'll just uh, flow this whole uh, topic in a kind of a small story so that i'm not going to talk much about uh, the biology 
and molecular details of the virus and all. But uh, anybody, uh, if interested in anything, they, they can simply interrupt me in between, or you can just uh, save your question for the for the end of the talk, and we will discuss it later on. So um, I, I I will uh, move on to the slide number two. So I will just. Uh, 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 confirm the slide number so that you will just walk through me. So this is a disease which I am talking about. Uh, it's called avian paramyxovirus disease. Uh, as name itself indicates, it's a disease of poultry. Uh, and it's a very, very important economical disease in poultry industry uh, because a lot of outbreaks are happening in, uh, in different parts of India. And huge economy is associated with it. Now, most of the time you, uh, you have heard about uh, the disease in bird flu and all. But 99% uh, of the time, it's not bird flu, it's this virus. The virus is pretty similar like bird flu. So if you see in the first panel, the poultry head is red. Red stands for there is a leakage of the blood vessels and the blood is coming to the face region. And once the blood is coming, blood is also associating itself uh, along with blood, the heat and the fluid part. So uh, in the... In the first panel, uh, if you see, there is a complete redness in the face. So uh, I was just explaining that the blood is uh, associated along with it, uh, some kind of fluid and the heat. So that is what uh, you see redness and swelling in the face. Um, Sometimes the virus goes to the brain. And if it goes to the brain, uh, you always encounter some kind of a nervine symptom. And in nervine symptom, there is a typical symptom in birds where there is a paralysis in the neck muscle. And once there is a paralysis, the neck is completely twisting upside down. And the bird is dying because of not able to eat or drink properly. It's not anything else. It's just they are unable to take food and uh, the particles uh, inside their body. Um, in post-mortem examination, this is called proventriculus, the top second panel. Uh, this is also called a stomach of poultry. It's a gizzard. So you see there are pinpointed small dots of blood vessel kind of rupturing. This is called pinpointed hemorrhages. So this is a typical feature. And this is called a clear cut sign that once you do a postmortem and once uh, you see this kind of lesion in the proventriculus of poultry, uh, one can easily say that the disease is because of paramyxovirus uh, infection. And in the last panel, it's a, it's a swelling of cecal tonsil. So this is a uh, this is a very important disease of poultry, and the government of India, in Indian Council of Agriculture Research, also has a great impact uh, on this. Uh, uh, and there is a separate funding to do research on this aspect, since uh, uh, this audience is pretty different than uh, the existing biology audience. So I'm just trying to emphasize that point. So I'm going moving to slide number three. Uh, as I said, this uh, this virus is mostly restricted to poultry, uh, and uh, uh, migratory birds is always a concern. So the birds which are traveling from across boundary, say we are setting the boundary with uh, other uh, countries as well. So the birds which are migrating from, say, Bangladesh or, say, Myanmar or, or Bhutan or something, they may carry the virus particles. So uh, this is a migratory disease pattern. Uh, mostly the disease is uh, um, transmitted by contaminated food and water. Uh, and this is airborne, like COVID-19. So this can always transmit through the nostril. Now, uh, once uh, people are saying that uh, transmission by uh, airborne, that stands clearly that you have something in the nostril that can hold the virus particle. So that means the receptor that is available in the host site can attach to the virus particle in the nostril. Well, mouth is also involved in this, but then the mouth is ultimately terminating to an area which is highly acidic in nature, that is stomach. So mouth is of least concern. So when people are talking mostly about the face covering and nostril, one has to take care mostly about the nostril covering. So this is what is uh, implication of the airborne diseases. So mostly the airborne disease is spread through the nostril, even though the virus is going through the mouth, it's not going to cause much of the stuff because Ultimately, the dead end is stomach acidic pH. We do have vaccine in, available in the market, and these vaccines are given to day old chicken directly on the eye. So, um, eye droplets is kind of a vaccination policy that uh, takes place in, in day old chicks when it is going to the broiler industry and also in the layer industry where egg production is there. So, this is a, a very important disease in terms of 
um, the economical aspect, egg production, and the meat production. Uh, so I'm moving to slide number four. Um, this is a typical virus feature. And uh, I will try to explain a little bit of this one and try to link something with the COVID as well. So this is a virus that is roughly spherical in say. Uh, now, this virus changes its say based on the environment. So say if it is in the nostril droplet or in the water, it is different. If it is in the dust, it is different. If it is in the uh, normal substratum, like in, in utensil or anything, the sur surface will change. And based on that, its infectivity also changes. So if it is spherical, it is highly infectious. And this is highly infectious when it is in the droplet form. Um, in the second panel, it is an electron uh, micrograph, a 1% phosphotungstic acid electron micrograph. So this is approximately 156 nanometer in diameter. And you see, this is an enveloped virus like COVID. So this, in, sorry. So the, this envelope is coming from the host cell membrane. Uh, and in, uh, this is the outer one. And uh, this envelope can tell you from where this virus is coming. So if a virus is coming from lung, it will carry the lung protein. So this is an indication. One can easily judge that the person suffered from a virus infection, secreted out the virus from, say, kidney, lung, or anything. So one can easily do proteomics analysis and look into that. Uh, this virus carries two surface glycoproteins. So you see in the surface there are two uh, projections. One is in the form of tetramer. So there are four protein embedded into it, and there are trimers. So these are three proteins. The so tetramer is called HN, which is hemagglutinin protein, and the trimer is called F protein. So basically, um, not to go in detail about this, so roughly the virus carries this kind of surface projection. Now, this is like a hand. So hand can hold on any object. Similarly, virus can hold the host cell by these hand-like structures. These are called receptor. These are called surface protein, and this surface protein can bind to the receptor in the host cell. And similarly, in COVID, you, we have a similar, I'll, I'll come to the slide later on. Uh, we have a similar kind of structure in the COVID as well, where you have a very specific protein called spike protein. So instead of a spike, we have here two different proteins. And internal, inside this uh, spherical uh, structure, the RNA genome is there. So these are the genome of virus, which is what uh, people are right now testing in case of COVID. So these are RNA particles which are embedded in the virus particles. So if a person is secreting out the virus particle, one can easily detect this RNA. So RNA is here. So to take RNA out, you have to rupture this upper outer side. And once you get this out, then only you can check the virus particle. Uh, so this is, uh, if you see, the RNA is not visible. It is completely covered nicely by this protein-like structure cell and all. So it is very stable RNA. Uh, it, it cannot be denatured or destroyed very easily unless until you remove out the protein. And this is what uh, similarly in case of COVID as well. Uh, so uh, I'm moving to slide number five. So this is just a rough representation of the replication cycle of the virus. So say this is a cell and you can just consider a lung cell or a nostril cell or a kidney cell or anything. Uh, this cell is having a nucleus, which is a regulator. And inside nucleus, we have DNA. And each cell is containing some sort of receptor, right? And in, in this case, it is sialic acid, which is a receptor present in most of the cell type. In case of COVID, you might have heard about this called angiotensin converting receptor, ACE2 receptor. So here it is sialic acid receptor. The virus binds to the sialic acid receptor, and then it internalizes and throws its genome into the cytoplasm. And once the genome is into the cytoplasm, it does all the biology, replication, and other things. And once this is uh, carrying out this process, approximately about 30 minutes or an hour of infection, the mature virus particle is coming out from the surface of the infected cell. Now, this cell is already dead because the virus is already infected to this uh, cell population. Now, the major concern, you don't want the neighboring cell to infect. And therefore, there is a way uh, host immune response does play a very important role. So uh, the, the neighboring cell population is very important when we are talking about immunology of the virus. So the virus does this uh, replication cycle. And this is pretty much similar to other viruses as well. I'm not discussing much of this uh, you know, ER and Golgi apparatus because that's not uh, related to this uh, whole uh, thing. So um, I'm moving to slide number six. And uh, from now onwards, I will discuss about what we have done in IIT Guwahati and how we have developed this as a tool.
to develop a vaccine against COVID-19. So um, uh, as I said earlier, we are in a, in a, in a very uh, uh, narrow zone where we are selling across uh, boundary of many countries, including China, Bhutan, and all. So uh, we uh, isolated this uh, avian pyramids of virus from the different poultry farms near Guwahati. And there are outbreaks in Hajo, Pandu, and Polasbari, and also in Manas National Park and other where peacocks were died because of this infection. So we did post-mortem in Manas and we identified the death was because of this virus. So we did a lot of isolation. And after isolating those viral genome, we did complete genome sequence analysis of this virus to identify that this virus was in fact avian pyramidovirus. And there is a concern. And we raised that there is a need of vaccinating the wild birds also, uh, because that death is happening in most of the part. Uh, because of this virus. So in past, we did a lot of genome sequence analysis, most uh, about 2023 20, papers, which we published uh, I, uh, saying that there is an outbreak of the virus and there is a need of uh, a different vaccine. And the current vaccine is not able to protect the birds, even in the wild and also in the wild, we are not doing vaccination. But in, in, in poultry farm, near broiler poultry farm or the layer poultry farm, we are having an outbreak and we do need to change the vaccine policy because the, the existing vaccine is not able to protect. So uh, based on this, I, uh, I'm, we, we started our study. We did a lot of uh, uh, work related to molecular biology of this virus, uh, trying to understand that how we can do, how we can develop a vaccine against this virus and all. So now uh, I'll just change uh, the whole thing and now move on to uh, the, the development part of the vaccine. So the the term which i'm going to use is called reverse genetics and uh, there are two terms one is called forward genetics and the other is called reverse genetics the forward genetics is what uh, say for example if you see a flower color and you see the flower color is yellow so you see something right and the seeing is called uh, phenotype so when, when you look into that that flower color is yellow you don't know what is there inside their genome so if you see the color and then go and hunt the genome. Then you identify that, look, uh, the color of the flower is yellow because the genetic map of the flower is like that. So once you see the color, and then you go for the genome, that is called forward genetics. That's what Mendel did uh, earlier, and uh, the classical genetics. But now people are looking back, actually. So we are not at all looking into the flower color. We are just looking into the genome in the lab. We manipulate the genome and then see that what kind of kind of flower we are getting, say whether we are getting purple, red, or yellow, and then we are defining that. Look, we have modulated the genome and then we, we created a virus. So why I'm saying that this is a very important concern right now in case of COVID-19, uh, because uh, there is a technique, and I discussed about this, about the virus, that the virus is important. And there, there is a concern that there is an outbreak and all. Now, why, uh, in this slide, I am saying how to create a virus. So basically, one can easily clone the complete genome. So I have cloned the complete genome of avian paramyxovirus into a vector, plasmid background. So basically, I have assembled the genome in lab. Uh, 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 this was one of the PhD student thesis. So he assembled all the genome. And once you assemble the genome, and I'm going to type number nine, you throw this genome into the cell. And after doing all this ma manipulation, you can recover the virus uh, here. So say, say you can provide this information, what you want, and you create the virus. And that is what happened in Wuhan case. That, that they were kind of creating the SARS coronavirus vaccine earlier isolated in 2003 and four in China, thinking that they will create some sort of vaccine. But instead of creating vaccine, they created some kind of mutant nuisance. And this DNA uh, was stored into the cytoplasm of a cell. You can create a virus particle. That is what is called reverse genetics. That means you are creating a virus particle by providing a genome sequence. Now, this is good in terms of vaccine production in case of poultry, because I know that which part of the genome is uh, dangerous. So I can cleave that part and create a virus. So that means a virus can be created by removing that pathogenic part. So if the virus is not carrying the pathogenic part, virus can be act as a vaccine candidate. And that is what our idea was. We kind of developed this vaccine that is very close to technology transfer by Hester Biosciences, which is Ahmedabad based poultry company. We are also having another one in Tennessee Biosciences.
places. So this is what we created. Now, one added advantage of this technology is, uh, like, uh, if you, uh, I'm moving to slide number ten. So this is a viral uh, uh, genome, and this is a virus. Now, the beauty about this technology is you can create an another cassette. So one can put a foreign gene. So instead of six genes, so this is a virus that carries N, P, M, F, H, N, N, L. So these are six protein that virus carries. Now, if you want to add an another gene, say seventh one, I can do it. And what will happen eventually is like this. So once I insert a foreign protein, uh, as in uh, I had just marked it red. So if I put an F foreign gene like FG, and if I choose a little bit of the molecular biology, I can fold this protein and outside. Right, so I can make a chimeric virus that can express these four uh, red color protein that is coming from outside. That is not a virus part. That's a different. Now, one thing I just want to emphasize here that this hand-like projection in the virus is actually the target of vaccine production because we are not going to create a, uh, uh, the vaccine against this. We will only create a vaccine against this. Now, vaccination is a techno is a term that is used in context of host, not from the part of virus, because host immune response can identify that hand-like structure, that virus helps to uh, carry or attach to the host cell receptor. Now these, uh, these surface proteins are the one which host cell look into very first time when virus infects a cell. And therefore, these proteins are the one which is very important in terms of the host cell to identify that this is foreign and let's produce some antibody to neutralize this virus particle and therefore these are very important uh, so uh, just to check the proof of concept there is a very common protein like everybody knows called green fluorescent protein it's a very small protein it's isolated from a jellyfish but it's a kind of an indicator that one can easily put a foreign gene to check that the, your, your system is efficiently expressing the protein or not so we did this experiment and it worked very nicely. So if you see, if you infect the cell, 12, 24, 36, and 48, complete saturation of the green color. That's indicate that we created an avian paralysovirus that can carry the green fluorescent protein. So once we identify that we have a green fluorescent protein, basically instead of green fluorescent protein, I can put anything X uh, and that anything could be any other protein of any other a virus or any other bacteria or any other pathogen uh, because this is what uh, we created as a tool now uh, one thing uh, uh, i'm moving to slide number 12 uh, why we are talking about this particular virus we started with a virus that is poultry pathogen and now i am discussing this virus as a vector uh, now uh, one thing is very sure that this virus is not infecting human so this is not a human pathogen but the sialic acid receptor that is responsible to cause infection is available in our nostril as well. So this virus can easily infect human being without causing disease condition. So virus can replicate, but will not get any disease condition. So this is one thing, this can be act as a vector that can carry the foreign protein, say for example, for COVID or any other protein to, to human being. And then human will not suffer from a virus infection. The same thing with the Oxford vaccine, same thing with the one which is coming out by Russia, same. They are just using a vector, and that vector is adenovirus. So that's a di different vector, our vector is different. So we have some advantages, some disadvantages. They also have some advantages and disadvantages. Um, this is very economical uh, in terms of Indian condition because uh, you know we are starting and producing this as a poultry vaccine. So the cost should be at least 10 paise per dose. Because if we increase 10 to 15 passe, nobody will buy that vaccine. So it should be very, very cheap. And therefore, we are creating this vaccine in embryonated chicken egg. And that egg is costing approximately 30 rupees. And that egg is having an embryo, embryo inside. So nine day old embryonated chicken egg we are using to create this vaccine. And that one egg can produce a vaccine that can easily vaccinate one lakh bird uh, per day. So this is a kind of an uh, economical concern. So it's a very cheap and therefore we believe that this will be a very cheaper way. The second very important thing is since I said it's an airborne, so the infection goes through the nostril. So what we are proposing that our vaccine or the one which we are using 
is the vaccine that can carry through the nostril. So we we'll spray it like an aerosol and the infection of the virus will happen naturally in the nostril. So we are not proposing anything as, a, as an injection or anything. Um, and the third very important thing is no pre-existing immunity. So say we are not at all infected with avian paramyxo so virus. None of us are infected. So if we're using it as a vector, the body don't know that this is a virus which we uh, I have encountered in the past. So we will not raise any immune response against this virus and the virus can easily infect us. Now this is for infection biology. Now the one which is circulating by Oxford and the one which is Russia is claiming, these are adenoviral based vectors. And we Indians are, at every one of us are infected with adenovirus once or twice in our lifetime, because that is a very common, uh, common cold infection that happens in case of all childhood uh, cases. Most of us are infecting every uh, alternate uh, you know, season of uh, this flu season, what you are saying, it's flu and it's adeno. Uh, both the viruses are co-circulating in the nature. So we do have uh, immunity. Now, how effectively we will be able to get that virus is again a question, right? So, uh, well, it's good for Europe and other places, but uh, for India, we have to think it differently. And uh, fourth, as usual, I, I, as I say, this NDV infects with the nostril and all. So uh, till now, what I have discussed is about a virus uh, that we isolated from Assam. We developed this virus as a tool to express any foreign protein that's what I, I i just discussed uh till now and in, in next slide i will discuss about a animal disease and a human disease for which we have developed a vaccine and then i move to COVID. so um so i'm in the side number 13. so uh, as all of you know that northeast is a area where people are consuming pork and this is a very important disease of uh, uh piggery industry called classical swine fever and uh, this is a very important in terms of livelihood of a uh, uh, poor farmer where the one or two pig is uh, having um, say piglet size of uh, 13 or 14 and they're, they're, that's all their livelihood. This virus is so dreaded that once it is infected, uh, infecting a pig population, it is swiping out complete uh, piggery within 24 hours. So there is a huge loss associated with this virus. and um, there is a, uh, a D, uh, so we have DBT unit of excellence uh, development of classical science virus vaccine. So there is an abortion, uh, the complete body turns yeah, bluish, that's what you call cyanosis. Uh, there is an abortion uh, in, in, in case of piggery, and therefore this is economically very, very important uh, and challenge, uh, challenging virus. So what we did is to, to tackle this virus problem, we thought to create a vaccine and not using classical swine fever virus because classical swine fever virus itself is there in the environment. And if you use that one to a vaccinate animal, it will again revert back and there are chances that again, there will be a different kind of disease condition. So uh, what we did, uh, I'm moving to slide number 14. So this is uh, in the top panel, you see this is like classical swine fever, virus, very similar virus. And this virus is having uh, in the surface, you see projection. And this is called envelope, wire, envelope protein. And this envelope protein is the one which is producing uh, antibody, neutralizing antibody uh, in, in, human, uh, in, in pig body. So pig requires this protein, not complete virus. So what we created is this virus. So here you see, this is our uh, avian paramyxo virus. And in the surface, we express this classical swine fever virus protein. So what we're having, we are having a poultry virus that expresses a pig virus protein on the surface. And this is what uh, was created uh, in order to do a vaccination. So we did a lot of trials in vaccinating pig. First challenge was whether our own poultry virus can replicate in pig. The answer was yes. So that trial took two years to do. And then we did all the different age group, uh, different uh, disease condition and other things to see that whether the virus is replicating or not. The second very important challenge, and I'm moving to slide number 15. Uh, the, the major thing is pig, uh, I don't know um, if, uh, you find, if you find any time you go uh, to a place called uh, Rani nearby, and there is a shoot called National Research Center on pig. And you have, you can see there a Yorkshire and Derbyshire, these are the breeds of pig. 
and the one pig uh, weight is approximately 350 kg 400 kg like that so these are all uh, bred uh, cross bred with uh, foreign breeds and these are very heavy and it's very difficult to hold this pig i, I just showed you a very a small tiny like piglet kind of thing which which you can hold in the hand and then you can vaccinate but it is impossible to hold a pig it's a very furious animal and there is a chance of uh, a traumatic condition as well so uh, people are always looking can we have some spray so that you can just spray from the outside and that is what the good thing in, in um, about our uh, strategy so what we did we uh, did a trial with 100 pigs and yorkshire and, and derbyshire and this we spread to the nostril and uh, then after 7 14 28 and 35 days post vaccination we showed that you can easily get rid of this virus if you can uh, do a booster vaccination using this uh, this uh, avian paramyxo virus. So we successfully created a vaccine uh, with this uh, uh, tool, which is coming from poultry for a pig population. So uh, this was uh, this is also very close to technology transfer by Indian Council for Agriculture Research. So this is uh, this is a model for uh, for animal and. Next time, moving to a human model, a very well-known virus, Japanese encephalitis virus. And you all know that this virus does a lot of encephalitic condition in, in human beings. So this is a human virus. And same, this is the virus, exactly same. And this also contains in service this enveloped protein. So one can, we do have a vaccine uh, in the market that uh, goes subcutaneously. So subcutaneous insect, uh, in, in, in injection of this uh, virus uh once or twice can give a protection but the problem is the virus itself reverts sometime back and do some kind of disease condition so therefore it is not advisable to do a virus and this is what in covid case also what we are trying to do in, in bharat biotech is we isolated the virus and we are making it inactivated of course this will be a better vaccine than the russian one and the one which is uh, uh, which is Oxford is claiming now, ours will be better for sure because this is our own viral strain inactivated by our own style. But the only problem is it requires a booster, and we don't know right now the immune response. We we do need a couple of vaccination in booster or not. Uh, so we 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 don't want to make a live virus, and therefore we inactivate the virus. Once we inactivate, the virus should go intramuscular or subcut injection. Uh, so same uh, in Japanese encephalitis virus also we created a similar kind of concept. We so this is the same new uh, avian paramyxo virus and we created this chimeric virus, putting this uh, uh, protein on the surface. Now it looks very simple here, but trust me, making one virus will take approximately three and a half years time. And this is one complete PhD. Uh, actually, um, uh, making this virus to express the protein in a very nice way is a very cumbersome task. To characterize this virus again is a very cumbersome task. And then we did internasal, and in this case, our model organism was mice, not pig, because mice can easily mimic the one which is there in the uh, human being. So we did a brain uh, titration, we, we isolated the virus, we, we did a lot of study in this, and, uh, and we, uh, we kind of claimed at the end of the day that we do have a vaccine candidate. Of course, this is nowhere close to uh, technology transfer. Now, this is very preliminary data that we we just created this vaccine as a candidate, and then we can try and see that if we can mimic something very close to the human being. Uh, so this is all about what we have done. So uh, till now, what I have discussed is uh, we isolated a virus called avian paramyxo virus, and this virus we created as a vector that can express a foreign protein. And I gave you two examples. One is classical swine fever, which is a pig disease. And the second one is Japanese encephalitis virus, which is a human disease. Now I'll just move on to COVID. And uh, I will discuss in three slides what we have done in COVID and what currently we are doing. So uh, this is what is COVID-19. Uh, it's called coronavirus disease condition. Uh, it's also called a severe acute respiratory syndrome syndrome because it's a collection of disease. So the collection of disease is called syndrome. Uh, so uh, it's a severe, acute stands for very fast. It is not chronic like tuberculosis. It is very fast and therefore it is called severe acute respiratory syndrome. So it is a very severe, very fast respiratory and collection of disease. 
um, as a coronavirus, and it is given two names because the one was uh, given to the one which are, which was isolated in 2003 and 4 in China. Um, so this is, uh, um, if you see in the first panel, so this is a very big genome, approximately 29,000, 30,000 base pair big. Um, this is a very old virus. A uh, lot of uh, study has been done in this virus using tests, um, various tools. Uh, even, um, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that slide uh, later, that we also did uh, a coronavirus, but that coronavirus was avian coronavirus in 2015. Uh, so this was uh, also a complete genome. Uh, now, the only thing which is more concerned here is this uh, kind of pinkish spike protein. And if you see, this is the virus. And this is the outer projection, which is we are talking. We just gave an example of CSFB, another. So this is the spike protein. This is the outer protein that binds to the host cell receptor. And this is the surface protein of coronavirus. And this is what is very important. So just if you can express this protein and throw into a human being, that will be a vaccine. And that is what Moderna is doing. That is what Oxford is doing. And that's what all the people are doing like that. So this is, this is the protein which every one of us is trying to express and express in outside. We are not at all touching this COVID-19 virus. We are trying to make this one synthesize outside and synthesize in the best possible combination so that it can go and raise an immune response in human being. So uh, if you see, uh, I'll just zoom it out. So this is a spike protein. And this is spike protein is this big, right? And you have S1 subunit in the first part and the S2 subunit in the second part. And then you have a small hinge region that is called cleavage site. Now that cleavage site stands for this spike protein will be chopped out into two parts, S1 and S2, once it is going inside the, uh, uh, inside the human body. Now, um, if you see uh, here, uh, the concern is uh, um, in slide number 17, I'm just doing an image. So this is a, this is a cleavage site, which is approximately 681 position here uh, to approximately 687 position here. Now, if you see, uh, I, I just zoomed out this box. So this is SARS coronavirus 2, which we are all talking about. This is bat virus, this is pangolin, this is human coronavirus. You see, these all viruses are having nothing in this particular region. But somehow, this SARS coronavirus 2 got this very unique site of RRAR. Now, RR is arginine, arginine, alanine, and arginine. These are the amino acid sequences. Now, these amino acid sequences are very, very uh, uh, unique sequence uh, that is responsible to cleave this protein into two parts very fast. Like in this protein, in this uh, five group of viruses which is there, we don't have this kind of sequence. So if we don't have this kind of sequence, this S protein will not be able to cleave fast. If it is not able to cleave fast, it will not spread. So this RRAR is what is giving spreadability to this COVID-19. So if, you, if any one of us can mutate this RRAR, that's all. This virus is like very earlier, uh, earlier any virus, because this is what is very unique in this group of viruses. So this, this cleavage site is somehow incorporated into this viral genome by man-made, say, we don't know, or say maybe in passage in some other animal species. So these are somehow a very unique mutation which has created in this virus. Now, why people are saying it's man-made is very strategic. If you see RRAR, uh, this is what is reported. So in I many... think we lost the connection. Uh... Now? No, it is can there. You... No, I can hear. I can hear. OK. Right. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Connection is there. Oh, yeah. oh stop. Fine. I, I... OK. The connection so... is fine. Right, right. So. So this is what is strategically done, right? And if you see this RRAR, I have not talked much of the molecular biology because uh, just uh, considering the audience here, um, this is what is present in influenza. This is present in my virus also. So I, I know that we can easily remove this four amino acid and it will not cause anything to the virus. So the virus will attenuate like very normal virus. Now, this RRAR is, is, is a side that can bind to the proteases and cleave this S1 and S2. Now, this cleavage 
is uh, done by proteases that are present in lung, that are present in kidney, that are present in gut, that are present in eye, that are present in brain, that are present in everywhere. That means this virus has already strategically identified some kind of mutation that can be cleared by various organ and therefore this virus can spread the disease to many organs and therefore it is pentropic. We don't know whether it will cause uh, D-dimer formation and causing blood clot, we don't know. Whether it will go to eye and cause conjunctivitis and spread to the brain, we don't know because the virus has very strategically identified this sequence. And this protease site is what is defining the viral spreadability. So this virus can spread because of the availability of the proteases, right? So one can easily mutate this virus and make this virus to only replicate in the lung. And that's what Wuhan people are were trying to do. They were kind of creating a virus that can very specifically replicate in the nostril. So once they will spray in the nostril, the nostril will be red because the virus will replicate there. But then, you know, the virus will not go inside the lung because in lung, the protease is not there. So the virus will not replicate in the lung. So this is very strategically done in molecular virology where people are creating this virus. But unfortunately, they were kind of a uh, little bit uh, misdirected in creating this another mutation which is there in the receptor binding domain, which is binding to AC2 more firmly than the other viruses. So this is uh, roughly about COVID-19. There are many other uh, uh, things. I just wanted to highlight some of the things. So, uh, the only very important is this protein. Rest is all nonsense. If you just remove that part, nothing going to happen. So this is the one which is very critical, and this is what every one of us is looking into. So coming to the COVID-19 vaccine project. So uh, I just uh, give you some highlight because they were knowing about the capability of our lab that we have already generated uh, uh, reverse genetics against uh, this avian pandemic virus. So, and they were also knowing about our two papers of classical swine fever and Japanese encephalitis virus. And uh, they thought that since Japanese encephalitis virus is a human virus and there is a high chance that we can float this virus as a tool. Now, uh, just to give an audience a little bit more into that, uh, this virus is already under phase three clinical trial for cancer therapy because this virus can selectively kill the cancer cells. So I'm one of the, la one of the aspect which I'm working right now is completely towards the cancer uh, therapy. So I'm using virus to treat cancer. So this virus can go nicely and only replicate in the cancer cell population. So I don't have time to discuss that part. So I just removed that part here. Uh, so uh, so there, is a, there is a large bit of information available in the data set there, uh, which suggests that this virus can be used in human because it's already in the trial. So uh, just putting all this formulation, uh, this Hester uh, Biosciences, uh, they they came to us uh, at the very beginning and they said that can we propose uh, avian pandemic virus for COVID-19 vaccine and we said yes. Uh, and then uh, what we we are trying, we are cloning this spike protein of sars cov virus here in the avian pandemic virus. This is our part. So we will give this virus, which is a poultry virus, it's a vaccine virus, it's a not a pathogenic virus which you can express on the spike protein of coronavirus. So we are not attaching coronavirus at all. This is just one protein of coronavirus. And this will be transferred to Hester by October 20th. That is what deadline fixed. I don't know what will happen. We are very close to, but again, as I said, it's not very easy. Uh, it's a 4 KD genome. It's a very huge uh, number of protein uh, involved in this one. So cloning this one is a very tedious one. And then again, uh, Putting it into the surface is again very challenging because most of the time the larger protein will stuck inside. And if it is stuck, stuck inside, there is no way uh, you can pull it back. So we are trying to make all this combination combination and all in order to make this one uh, feasible. And once uh, this is there, we'll transfer it to Hester and Hester will do uh, animal study validation and commercialization. So I'm not discussing much of this thing here. So we are very close to transferring it out uh, to Hester. So our part is done. Uh, and we are on a very similar platform what uh, uh, Bharat Biotech is. Bharat Biotech also did the same thing. They transfer the whole thing and the trial is going on. We are also in the same phase. We will also try, uh, tra transfer and they will do the trial and characterization and all. Uh, but we have very less control on the last part. So we are just transferring this out and uh, rest part they will, uh, they will do. 
Um, so this is what uh, is the project which we are working on on COVID-19 uh, in IITG. Uh, and um, uh, since, uh, you know, in this era of COVID-19, everybody jumped into the field and uh, it's a huge commercial impact here, right? Most of the people are trying to find out that can we sell, say, a sanitizer saying that it's a COVID-19 thing. Uh, uh, it can kill COVID-19 virus or so forth, right? Uh, same thing happened in here also. So uh, I just summarized some of the things. There are multiple projects running in the lab as of now. 19 consultancy project is running in the lab as of now. Uh, so this is the chamber which I recently installed in the in the our market complex. Probably you have seen there are 12 uh, UV lamps here, right? And uh, these are uh, found. Uh, this these are uh, kind of uh, fabricated by uh, Works uh, Solution Metal. Uh, uh, there is a company in, in Jaipur. And Central Morgan from Chemical Engineering Department was associated in formulating the whole thing. Just all the antiviral studies and everything was done in our lab. Uh, we have this DST uh, grant where we are trying to understand that can we uh, coat this one with uh, some antiviral uh, material and then we can test it as a surgical mask or N95. We, although mask is there, but can we create something called antiviral so this uh, mask and uh, this uh, n95 respirator uh, is kind of coated with a with an, a nanoparticle or somebody is coating with some kind of hydrophobic material and all and then we are testing uh, this is a third one which is uh, a lemongrass tea and this is a uh, they are claiming that uh, it's a cct and it's done it's a company called um, um agri sui generis in imphal and they are claiming that it's a uh, it's an it's kind of an uh, elevating arthritis and other things. So they approached us in March saying that can we do some antiviral study? And we also did some of the study. And now uh, yesterday I got a letter from uh, government of uh, Manipur saying that uh, it's a health department. This is kind of a promoting as an official uh, uh, drink. I, I I really don't know what is the use of that. But anyway, this is the lemongrass tea where they are uh, putting. And there are many uh, small uh, drug companies they are, they, they are putting all this formulation where they are uh, uh, using different kind of combination of curcumin, aloe vera, and all kind of stuff. And this combination, they are putting some cocktail and they are just trying to test here uh, using some of the virus which we are having in the lab. So, um, so there are eight companies of Ayurvedic formulation. CCT is a single surgical mask and there are four or five companies and UV chamber. And then we also signed an agreement with uh, Eureka folks where they are using a a small bit of uh, air purifier and our job is to see the filter how much air is coming and all uh, so this is what is in nutshell we are working on other projects of covid 19 apart from vaccine and uh, this i, I just discussed uh, and in the slide number 20 it's the last slide so this is uh, what i i was mentioning in earlier so this is avian coronavirus so we do have a virus called avian coronavirus it's the same virus but there is a species restriction. This infects only poultry. This is a vaccine. This is also a very important concern in poultry industry. It does cause a disease condition called infectious bronchitis. And uh, this virus is uh, a vaccine virus is available in our lab. So we were kind of testing. So if you see, this is a virus control. This is completely killing. And this uh, redness is an indication that virus is pantropic. So the virus replicates everywhere. And if you treat five minutes by UV and 15 seconds, five seconds and 15 seconds by UV, you can see that the embryos are completely fine. That's an indication that the UV is uh, kind of protecting. So we, uh, as I said, uh, so in the earlier, uh, the one which is uh, installed in the marketplace is completely killing the virus particle in five seconds and also in 15 seconds. So uh, in approximately about 30 seconds, there is a complete nullification of the and completely lethality of the virus particle. So we we do a lot of uh, different kind of tests using avian coronavirus as a, as a, as a model. Just to show that the sanitizer or the mask or say uh, the UV chamber or a formulation or any other thing are basically killing coronavirus because we can't handle COVID-19. So we do have a very good model uh, called avian coronavirus. So we are just uh, trying to concentrate um, on putting all the data related to COVID-19 uh, with, a, with a mimicking uh, stuff with avian coronavirus. 
So that's all from my side. Uh, I just tried to simplify it, uh, saying uh, any without saying any any technical term and all. But uh, you are most welcome to ask anything if you have in your mind. And in the last slide, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, a lot of my PhD students are involved and in fellows and collaborators and all. And um, I'm very thankful uh, that I, from very beginning, from 2012 onwards, I was um, generously funded by DVT, DST, and ICMR. Uh, still, uh, we have very uh, uh, we we are affluent in terms of our research funding, uh, in terms of vaccine production and diagnostics and all. Um, I, I have not discussed much about the diagnostic. We are also working on the diagnostic fronts, um, in in terms of making some room temperature based uh, COVID nineteen direction. Uh, which is polymerase spinal reaction. Uh, so that is also a part of the research which we are uh, trying to do. Uh, this uh, talk was mainly towards the vaccine, so I just uh, stick to the vaccine part. Uh, thank you so much for your patience listening, and I, I, I'll be more than happy to answer any question if you have uh, anything apart from this topic, uh, or anything related to COVID-19 and, and any other aspect. Thank you. So, Thank you, Professor Sachin, for giving such a nice talk and, uh, and uh, also enlightening us uh, about the recent work going on in COVID-19, which were a uh, curiosity of many of us. Uh, so now floor is open for the questions. Uh, so you may ask the question. Uh, Pankaj, may I? Yeah. Yeah, Sachin, thanks for the talk. I have Thank you. two very naive questions. Yeah. Uh, one is uh, in that slide of uh, Japanese encephalitis. Yeah. You, you said that, uh, I mean, our vaccine would be much better than that was proposed by the Oxford University or even the Russian one. Yeah. Um, and uh, basically, it's the booster that yeah. is uh, what is missing, if I understand it correctly. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I really didn't understand. Yeah, I mean, yeah. What I, 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 and what exactly is its role? Yeah. So uh, actually, um, what what I showed in uh, in my all uh, presentation that we are using a virus which is isolated from avian species. So our tool is avian. So it, it, this actual that this virus is actually isolated from avian species. So this is not a human virus. But the one Oxford and other people are using is the one which is actually human virus. Adenovirus is a human virus. So they are using human virus to infect human. They are using a poultry virus to infect human. So our safety concerns are far higher as compared to there. Now, the second thing is, of course, there will be more efficacious because there, uh, the virus adeno is also a known pathogen of human being. Of course, there is a lot of mutation and other thing uh, has been uh, carried out. And this is a very well studied. Now, one thing which I, I just wanted to highlight here because a lot of people are un Known about now these people are saying that you know vaccines are ready without any uh, this thing now why they are saying it because this is a very old virus adenovirus expressing any foreign protein is not a new story this is coming for 2000 uh, onward then 1990 there was a first trial started in adenovirus as a vector uh, there was first death reported in 2000 and therefore there is a complete stoppage of adenoviral as a vector because of the cytokine storm and if you see there are a lot of literatures coming out because COVID-19 is also a major virus uh, that does a lot of cytokine storm in human body. So um, there is only one thing that, uh, you know, this virus is a human virus and ours is, a, is, a, is an uh, avian virus. Um, there also they are planning it for nostril vaccination, but mostly they will go for the intramuscular or subcut injection. So there, if at all you are going for a subcut or intramuscular injection, there is a requirement of booster. So booster vaccine is required when uh, when people are talking about intramuscular subcut vaccination. Okay. Okay. So if I understand correctly, I mean it's uh, basically the direct carrier of the virus, or the primary one is the animals. So yes, yes. That way, that way, I mean, uh, separating that out from the animals uh, yeah. it gives you you know the more realistic approach. That's what right. I mean. Right. So this will be a live infection, right? So once the, I will throw one virus particle, it will replicate and produce 10 more, right? But then the virus is poultry. So it is not going to cause disease condition. But this is spike protein of coronavirus will be more. 
and this will raise an immune response far better as compared to uh, other approaches. But the only limitation is this virus has not been proposed uh, to the extent of animal, uh, sorry, human vaccination as of now. And therefore, there will be a huge regulatory concern at the downstream. Uh, we may end up in stucking to that part for a longer day. But now SEPI and other people are trying relaxing this, uh, you know, regulatory aspect for COVID-19. Uh, my second question was that uh, apart from this vaccine, there are these other products that you mentioned. So one yes. that just caught my attention is this lemongrass tea. So yes. I didn't get what exactly, I mean, is the purpose of this thing? Right. Uh, so uh, you know, help in the current situation. Right. So uh, what they are uh, claiming uh, is this is a, a tea which is natively consumed by uh, most of the Imphal people. And they liked it, it seems. I, I don't know really. So they approached me uh, giving this uh, CCT and they wanted to see and do some antiviral study. And the idea was, uh, can they sell this product more uh, in the market saying that, you know, I have a, a, we have a tea that can protect from COVID-19 as well. So that was their initial idea. Uh, so uh, as uh, we said that we don't have COVID-19, by the way, uh, we can test it in uh, Newcastle disease, uh, so avian paramyxo virus or other viruses as a model. So we tested it. The other part which uh, came out nicely is uh, uh, taking this tea is upregulating the immune response. Upregulating the immune response means uh, you you see a lot of uh, cytokines which are very important in human body. Like uh, the whole purpose of taking chavanpras or other thing is internal boosting your immune response. Uh, somehow we identify that drinking uh, this tea might have some kind of phytochemicals. I don't know what kind of phytochemicals. But these phytochemicals are somehow upregulating some of the host immune regulatory molecules, which are, may be helpful in boosting the immune response. Right? So uh, what we propose that, look, taking this tea probably helping uh, the cell to boost an immune response. And they are trying to highlight this one as immunomodulator effect. And because of the immunomodulator, it could be an antiviral. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sachin, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, how is your RRAR sequence uh, is, you know, results in a fast uh, mutation or very aggressive mutation? Uh, right. very, yeah, what, very good question. Yeah. What would be anything uh, different? I mean, if this sequence is not followed, uh, like you don't have anything uh, in that in, uh, in place of R, R and A, yeah. And you have only R at the end for all of them. Yes. So if this R, R and A, uh, I mean, is there a possibility that you replace it by something else uh, also to arrest this mutation? Yes, yes. So that's what, uh, 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 so what is happening, say, <coughs> so uh, as I said, the infection and the spreadability of the virus depend upon the cleavage pattern. So this is a cleavage site. So this R, R, A, R, can help in breaking this spike protein into two, S1 and S2. So this breaking potential of uh, this spike protein depends upon this site. Somehow, this virus acquired this RRAR. Now, this RRAR, acquisition of this site can help many proteases. Earlier, say this uh, bat coronavirus, if you see this bat SARS coronavirus, this is nothing, right? There is no RRAR. So, mm. There is no RRA here, so this virus can only cleave in lung. That means the proteases available in the lung can only cleave this site. But here, acquisition of this RRA can help this virus to cleave this spike protein in all the organs because the proteases can access this uh, RJ. This is basic amino acid residue, actually. RR is a basic amino acid residue. And if you see chemistry point of view, this can easily cleave by many proteases like trypsin and other kind of proteases. And therefore, the spreadability of the virus, and this is a pretty well known in influenza field. Influenza virus like bird flu, H1N1 outbreak happened because this is the problem. If one can easily mutate this RR into any other, like you can add alanine, AA, and this virus will be like any other virus. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I have a question. Sure. Yeah, it is just a rather than question, it is a query. 
Uh, I would like to know whether the effect of some of the metallic nanoparticles has been studied onto this uh, uh, onto this virus. Okay, so you are you are asking about the nanoparticle based uh, science with this virus, right? Right. Yeah, people are trying, but you know uh, this is uh, so. If you see, this is the virus particle, right? right. So the nanoparticles are directed towards this one. Hmm. Only the spike protein. So one can do in vitro neutralization of the virus, but using this nanoparticle based therapy for internal uh, kind of uh, uh, inhibition of the virus particle when the virus particle is replicating in the cell is kind of challenging because once uh, you have to achieve one thing that your uh, nanoparticle should be non-toxic to the cell and once it is going inside, you can target some of the proteins, viral protein and all in order to do it. So all the study till now of the nanoparticle based studies are restricted to the surface protein, only in the surface. So this is spike protein only. Okay. So are you doing or your group is doing uh, on such kind of things or not? Nanoparticle based. Yeah, nanoparticle nano based. So I, I'm not a nanoparticle biologist, but you know, as I said in this uh, uh, thing, right? So this surgical mask, and this N95 respirator is quoted. Actually, my question, one of my question was uh, coming on the surgical mask point of view, of course. Yeah, so here only. So if you coat the surgical mask with nanoparticle coat, right? And if you integrate with nanoparticle, now there are known antiviral like zinc is there, copper is there. Uh, you can add gold nanoparticle also. This can simply deactivate the spike protein. That's very simple, right? There's no science in that. So one can easily coat the mask on the outer surface. So one can coat the mask here. So that's what people are trying to put all the nanoparticle based formulation to coat the surgical mask. And we are just testing it out that whether yeah, this. Okay. Uh, already testing it. Yes, we are, we are testing it out. No, why I'm saying is that uh, we are uh, making the nanoparticle using laser. And uh, for the antibacterial studies we have done with the, in collaboration with the LATA and uh, it was recently okay. successful. So, okay. and, and the technique which we are using for uh, synthesis is a very simple technique. It's not involving any chemical. We are simply producing it into the distilled water. And uh, so I was just thinking, is there any scope of uh, doing the, this kind of collaboration with you or Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can, we can do it. Uh, so there, there are multiple uh, ways. Uh, so I, I will uh, tell you the two examples in our campus itself. So Uttam uh, Manna from chemistry department, he developed some kind of a hydrophobic material. So uh, he coated this hydrophobic material. Now he is also trying to add some of the more antiviral stuff and all. So we are trying to test it where, whether this hydrophobic is antiviral as well. Uh, I, same thing is when Dimal Katyari is also have a DST grant where they are using respirator N95 mask and coating it with polylactic acid. So in their part, polylactic acid is uh, impregnated with a nanoparticle containing some kind of copper uh, and gene. Uh, but I don't know how relevant it is and all. We are trying to test it out uh, to see that whether it is effective or not. So yes, we can do it. It's supposed to be quite toxic compared to the silver uh, or the copper nanoparticles. So I don't know whether it would yeah, but it's just an outside coating, actually, right? Yeah, it is outside coating. But, uh, it's not right. So you are, you are talking about whether you are uh, if somebody is inhaling it in uh, that will be toxic, right? Of course, in the limited dose, this uh, the, particularly for the silver and the gold nanoparticle, I think it is a proven fact that in the limited dose, it is not going to the toxicity to the, the cells. Yes. So if we do it in a limited doses, probably one can do the testing and find it out. Right. Yeah. For the silver and the gold nanoparticle. Yeah. Yeah. Because both these elements, they do not get gold anyway, it doesn't get oxidized so easily. So, mm -hmm. so it won't form, it will remain active for quite some time. If I remember it correctly, I think they coated with zinc. Uh, Maybe yeah. the zinc will be slightly cost effective or something like that. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So that could be the reason. But we can easily make a silver or the gold nano. But silver, of course, we have done silver and copper, and and we have done the antibacterial testing. But the gold, we wanted to try uh, 
but then the lockdown started and we have to curtail that was no student no i i will tell you the situation with a, a, a company called jota pharmaceutical uh, they have three combination of this compound uh, one is haldi and the other is two other compound they are not revealing it out but i could see the turmeric color because curcumin is there um so these uh, three compound they have coated initially i thought that they are talking about to make it as a tablet so that they can sell it out because i can see in their website there are a lot of tablets ayurvedic formulation they are selling saying that covid 19 corovel or something they are saying like that uh, but ultimately i learned that they are trying to coat it the surgical mask because they are thinking that after putting it in boiling water they are getting some sort of a formulation uh, which can be an antiviral so they are uh, apparently they are in a very uh, uh, close uh, uh, they have done initial study and they are selling it out also in gujarat uh, they are just coating the mask with this uh, you know the mask looks uh, yellow in color uh, because of this turmeric but then then they are suggesting that this is an antiviral and these are all masala kind of thing so these are not uh, uh, harmful to the human beings okay so yeah. maybe i will talk to you in detail little later sure sure yeah fine okay fine thanks so any other question can i ask a question uh, sure yeah, yeah please yeah so Hi Sachin. So thank you. Very nice. So so I have a very nice question. Like uh, so, you said that the avian flu is, uh, I mean, the virus is airborne, and uh, initially people said that the COVID is also, uh, I mean, COVID is not airborne. But now people are yeah. saying that it is, it might be airborne. So what particular aspect actually decide whether it is airborne? So uh, you are talking about uh, aspect of. I will give you an example of polio. You know polio virus, right? Right. if you infect polio virus to a 8 year old kid nothing going to happen if you flood 1 kilo of polio virus also nothing going to happen but a single drop of polio virus in uh, in in age group below 5 years is highly toxic it can cause paralysis within 24 hour now this all viruses does play a very important role in receptor biology so the virus has proteins on the surface and this protein can bind to the receptor in the host cell in the viruses like uh, um say influenza or any other virus which i discuss also they bind to the sialic acid receptor now the sialic acid is available in the nostril of almost all individuals including uh, all lower vertebrates also there are other sialic acid form um so the virus can easily spread by the nostril um i don't know how who uh, told uh, this one it's well known that the coronavirus can spread by nostril easily and that's what the receptor is of course this virus acquired this ace2 receptor very specifically but it this virus can bind to sialic acid as well because the virus can not only bind to a single receptor the virus can bind to multiple receptor of course the pathology and other thing associated with ace2 is very high and therefore the 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 disease is more pro- progressive when you have an ac2 receptor which is very common in blood vessels and other places but ac2 receptor equally expresses in the nostril and therefore when you have a uh, age 50 and plus this ac2 receptor is expresses more in the nostril and this is well known actually in medical field that angiotensin converting enzyme expresses more in 50 <clears throat> plus age group and if it is like that then of course 50 plus age group is more susceptible for this disease condition okay Yeah. thanks yeah. yeah some questions from the students uh, student participants here yeah yeah hello sir yeah please yeah. yeah so on similar lines could you also explain uh, like you talked about age group in which polio uh, infects uh, a person Uh, similarly yeah. why is it seen that uh, cases of corona virus are not fatal for children below let's say age of 10 uh, same thing same same philosophy actually you know yeah. uh, and in layman language if you uh, read a virology book the first thing uh, lecturer tell you that look the disease is less susceptible in young individuals and more susceptible in the so there are there are things right the immune response the receptor is not well formed actually the ac2 receptor is not well developed so ac2 receptor biology is not well concurrent in case of young ones 
teenager, like 17 or a 16 year, because there is no blood pressure cases, right? You don't see blood pressure cases in 15 years and all. So it all depends upon the receptor biology. So largely this disease can, uh, can control the population or control the human body based on the receptor biology. So if the receptor expresses more, the chances of infectivity is more, right? In children, teens, teenager, the AC2 receptor is less explored and less uh, expressed. And therefore, you have very less chance to get it infected. Apart from that, you have a very robust immune system in, in young individuals. So even if the virus is infecting, the immune response is taking care of it. And remember, this virus is far, uh, you know, I, I still believe it, this far, uh, virus is far less uh, pathogenic as compared to flu. H1N1 is far deadlier than this virus. And, you know, uh, there are multiple reports. Uh, since you are just looking into the broader picture, I will tell you the situation internally. The people dying in COVID-19 are also positive for H1N1. But since they are not at all worried about H1N1, so everybody is putting into the basket of COVID-19. Nobody knows that the death is happening because of H1N1 pathology. Nobody knows. So lung is a major factor, but not everybody is dying because of the blood clot. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. Um, Hi, Sachin. Uh, so I have yeah. a slightly difficult question for you. Yes. Um, so now, being an expert and knowing what is going on, how a virus works, what do you think our future, next six months or so? <laughs> no, you know, I, I from very beginning, actually, um, uh, I guess... This uh, is by the way, yeah. Yeah, so many, many of you uh, might be um, uh, know that our lab is working for a very beginning time, right? So. Uh, most of the time, uh, my colleague also look into me and then say, putting their mask immediately, right? So that Sachin is R H lo laga lo mask. So uh, it's like uh, uh, there is a there is a fear, of course, there is a fear, right? But uh, I I believe very from the very beginning, I believe that you know this will be turned into a normal flu-like symptom. You have this symptom, go to doctor. Doctor will give you prescribe you some kind of medicine, you rest it, and then you will be fine. Um, there will be a vaccination, it will come somewhere in some kind of therapeutics will be. but this virus will be there in the environment. Yeah, right. We, we can't get rid of this virus. This is so much now into the system. Uh, of course, this, uh, uh, you know, outside uh, the virus present in the environment will be dead or kind of inactivated by the high temperature uh, post uh, this uh, summer season. Uh, so uh, we'll get rid of this environmental virus, but the one which is say, there in the circulation will eventually get into, we'll raise an herd immunity, which is true actually, uh, in due course of time, and we'll be all right, I guess. There will be a mortality, and this mortality should not be associated with something uh, very pathogenic nature of the COVID-19. So I do believe that uh, uh, things will be normal like a normal flu. So it will be going like uh, a normal infection. So people will go to the doctor and they will prescribe some kind of uh, flu-like symptom kind of medicine. And if symptomatic treatment will be done. And once the body will uh, raise an immune response, it will be cured off. Yeah. That's I my opinion, that, actually. Yeah, that is very positive. But what we see, you know, um, if you look at the statistics, maybe for 90% or more than that, uh, you know, it is, it is just like a flu uh, and somebody may you know, it, it will just go by without the person realizing it. But yeah. for a very small percentage of cases, why it becomes so vile? Uh, why the virus acts in a different way? And the person may collapse within hours. That is what we see. Maybe because of some other reason or is it because of the virus? No, uh, actually, you know, there are uh, virus based uh, uh, already virus as, as you if you see the virus is very similar like uh, a virus which was isolated in 2003-04 there was there at that time of uh, at that point of time also there was death associated with but that virus was not death spread uh, spreadability of that virus was not that high so that was restricted to the hospital level and therefore the uh, the coronavirus uh, outbreak SARS coronavirus was uh, curtailing the china itself but this virus somehow spread the cost uh, now, what you're saying is correct. There are certain uh, group of people where, you know, uh, there are multiple things associated with it. It's not about virus only. It's about the host immune response, host physiological condition, the nutrition. Everything does play a role, right? Uh, so it's all like collection of uh, effect that's uh, 
and of course it's a long term ventilation ventilator ventilators uh, given to a, a longer duration of time to a patient is also sometime uh, a very nuisance actually because it will create a lot of uh, you know opportunistic pathogen and these are also creating a lot of other problems as well so uh, these are all multifactorial right so we cannot blame only covid 19 virus of course it's a it's a pathogenic we, we are we are not denying it out but uh, there are multiple multiple factors that is associated with this virus right uh, ph host physiological condition nutrition and everything uh, like uh, you might have gone through a lot of literature is coming right blood pressure yeah. diabetes cardiovascular diseases this are like preliminary uh, condition and this will aggravate the disease condition faster but most of us you know might be infected earlier also now the only thing is we our diagnostic is so robust therefore we are getting it uh, uh more cases are uh, uh, coming positive you know but most of us might be uh, infected long time back actually this came in the september october itself right so uh, we were able to uh, do screening very robustly uh, post march but now it is more aggressively because we have this uh, antigen detection uh, this rapid detection uh, lateral flow which is detecting in half an hour uh, apart from rt pcr so that's what uh, i believe it's a multifactorial Okay. Thank you. So, so we have one question from one participant who have written on a chat box. Can I read, okay. Professor Sachin? Sure, sure. Please, please, yeah. please. So the question is: Do the new strains of uh, coronavirus or any other virus always have the same cleavage site or an even more complicated one? Very good question. Yes, absolutely correct. So I will ask uh, uh, ask this question. Yes, yes. It's it's a very relevant question. and uh, you know um, uh, there is a textbook of veterinary virology uh, by fenar and it is uh, uh, i studied it long time back I, i just remember that line of the textbook every cat cat is a very common reservoir cat coronavirus is very common every cat is having its own coronavirus that means it is very very mutable it's it's a highly mutated virus so next season we don't know there is something more nastier than covid-19 waiting for us so this virus is changing a lot they may acquire some kind of mutation they may end up in getting something else right so there is always possibility that this will uh, do mutation uh, in different host species and may uh, convert into some other mutated virus particle so this is very uh, true and very relevant in the field of coronavirus it's a very common question uh, it's it's a, it's a very pertinent and very correct uh, uh, statement yeah uh, i have one related question that uh, we many time we hear about the asymptotic patient and yeah. they carry the virus yeah. so uh, do they uh, do they carry the when they carry the virus this virus uh, multiplicate or uh, it uh, remains same as number or they can only get transferred to other body uh, whenever they find the chances so asymptomatic stands for Uh, they are not showing any symptom now what will happen say for example a person uh, went out and uh, uh, contaminated himself or herself with any covid-19 uh, uh, patient uh, after 3 to 4 days because virus will take some time to replicate inside the host body so say after 72 hours on an average the virus will establish its infection and after 72 hours the virus will start spreading out uh into the atmosphere and next 3 4 days is active replication so say after 72 hours the virus will be coming into the environment by that person very actively in in in, in form of uh, say droplets or other thing in next 3 days now after that the virus will be slowly subsiding down and after 8 days there will be no virus in that person body right now in this course of time the virus establishes its infection in different organs say in lungs or other places now there are chances if the person is the uh, immune response is good and if uh, there is no underlying condition the virus may not produce that much pathogenicity and therefore the person may be asymptomatic and in case of symptomatic also there are milder symptomatic uh, also so they may show some kind of symptom if the virus replicates and damage certain group of organ but the virus can only be spread at the active replication cycle only after that the virus will be established and do infection the damage done by the virus is done um, in a very early stages and rest all the is the immune response of the host cell okay any other question that we have 
Okay, if not, then uh, let's thank again Professor Sachin Kumar for giving such a uh, nice talk, and uh, the, uh, it, it was wonderful to have all the informations uh, that we will be looking uh, that we were looking uh, for long time. And, uh, and uh, I hope that uh, and, uh, he will get success in his uh, in the, he and his team will get success in the endeavor. And, uh, and uh, I also thank all of you uh, for uh, the, actively participating in this talk. And uh, we hope uh, to continue this trend uh, in future also. And so with that, uh, I formally uh, close the session. And before closing, I also would like to thank uh, Basav and his team for uh, the, uh, for managing all the technical uh, part uh, of this talk. And uh, they will also manage in future. So if Professor goes, if you want to uh, mention something. Uh, yeah, uh, on behalf of Department of Physics, I thank everybody for taking parts and all the participants because I do see that there are people uh, participating who are not members of physics department. So thanks to them. We try to uh, do a Facebook live also, but you know, this is the first time we are doing. So there is a technical breach. The audio was off. So from next time onwards, we will be trying to do a better job. And this is going to be a regular feature in our calendar. So all of you, just stay tuned. Uh, uh, look for the next possible uh, uh, sort of announcement. OK, thank you all. Thank you. So thank you. Then we formally close this session.